Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Students of Florida history, here we go. Columbus sails west. Always the always controversial, but to me, always intriguing Genoese mariner who sold his services to the crown of Spain after other countries had refused and changed the history of the world. Some people say he is a glorious failure. Other people say that he was, uh, shall we say, lucky. And one thing is for sure, we will never agree on how much Columbus changed the history of North America and Europe by this, these bold adventures into the, what they called in those days, the Ocean Sea, the Atlantic Ocean, where some parts of the Atlantic Ocean are so deep that they almost appear black. Wow. Okay, here we go. We talked about the idea that Christopher Columbus was a controversial figure, but we have to judge him as a man of his time and not by 21st century standards. Yes, the charges of slavery and abuse and ethnocentrism, yes, I am sure there is a lot of historical evidence. But on this particular examination, we'll be more concerned about his achievements and not so much about his distractions. The record books will show that he was definitely a man of contradictions. Personally, I really enjoyed teaching about Columbus because as a man of the sea myself, his navigational skills and his determination have always inspired me. Okay, now you might recall that there was an incredible mathematician by the name of Ratocines, and Ratocines lived long before Jesus, and by using geometry, shadows of the sun and the moon, this mathematician was able to figure out and calculate the circumference of the earth at about 25,000 miles. That blows my mind. There were people back in those days who truly believed that the world was flat. Or if you were an ancient Chinese mathematician or astronomer, I should say, they actually believed that the entire world was traveling on the back of a galactical turtle crawling his way through the cosmos. Crazy stuff. So this is going to be one of those guys who's going to be a game changer. A lot of the maps that are going to come out of the age of Columbus were actually copies of taken from the Library of Alexandria, Alexander the Great, the great Macedonian conqueror who had no problem with his ego, naming 33 cities after himself. But the most famous of the Alexandrias is the one in Egypt and the incredible library. The library on top was actually allowed to be used by all citizens, but the library below was allowed only for Alexander and his cohorts and most trusted military leaders. You see, this thing was almost like a database, a military database. He had plans and maps, topography. He knew your rainfall, your rivers. He knew your superstitions, your religion. He knew everything about you because he was an incredible student of history. And you know, he was always forewarned before his campaigns, and so he was forearmed. Some of those maps are going to be duplicated after Alexandria is destroyed by the Vandals. When they burnt and destroyed the upper library, it was very fortunate that the debris buried the secret library below. And when it was discovered about the age of the Renaissance, a lot of these maps were sold, stolen, copied, traveled all over the world, and Columbus is reported to have a map that was copied from one of the maps in Alexandria. And if you look at this map, which is pretty good, this is the one examples, right? It looks pretty accurate, but the problem was that Columbus was in the wrong school of thought. He truly thought that the world was only 18,000 miles in circumference and not 25,000. 
as the earlier Greek mathematicians had suggested. He had the wrong map. And when he makes his calculations to try to sell to Asia to deal directly with the merchants in Cathay, or what they call China, or India, he did not understand that the journey from Spain to Asia was going to be much further than he calculated, not to even mention the fact that he did not know that he was going to encounter a whole new continent to the Europeans. Now, the Silk Roads, I don't know if you remember this in ninth grade or not, the Silk Roads are one of the greatest chapters in world history because along these camel paths traveled everything, not just silk and technology and spices and medicines, and but it was cultural diffusion, ideas, religions, beliefs, right? All sorts of stuff like this. So Europe was really, really dependent upon the merchants who brought incredible stuff all the way from the Far East. And one of the favorite things going back to the ancient Romans was silk. Yes, made from the boiling of the silkworm cocoons. I mean, silk was around when Jesus, even Emperor Tiberius, this was the times of Jesus. And silk was a sign of wealth and prosperity and social ranking. It was not the age of cotton yet, men. And wool, oh, and leather could not hold up to silk. Silk breathed, it held color well, and quite frankly, it was a sign that you had arrived. Well, the silk merchants, men, they could charge whatever they wanted. And the problem was, is that when it finally reached the marketplaces of the Middle East, and it reached the marketplaces of the ancient European empires, the markup was incredible. Because every time the camels and the silk merchants or the spice merchants traveled through a new kingdom, they had to pay a toll or a fee. And at the end of that long 18th month journey, you could end up paying four or 500% markup. So Columbus's idea was instead of having to pay these markups and, and pay the taxes, why not sail west and deal directly with the people of Asia. That idea was incredible. And the Portuguese had already started this. You see, the Portuguese, who were fantastic deep water sailors, were building ships, but they did not want to go west across the Atlantic. They thought that was way too risky. The storms, the uncharted waters, who knows what's out there. Stories of gigantic krakens and, and uh, monsters, sea monsters. So what they would do is they would hug the Iberian coast, they would hug Africa, hug India, hug uh, Malay and the islands of Indonesia to reach these ports. Columbus wanted to do it quicker and faster by sailing west. We talked about the idea of these medicines, how the Asians believed that these medicines could basically bring your health back by bringing you realigned into the four elements, earth, wind, fire, and water, and how using certain of these natural, mad, uh, uh, natural medicines, right, that you could restore a man's vitality by opening his chakras or energy channels. Remember we talked about dis-ease and easing the inflammation of the body? Men, these spices were used for everything from fertility to literally easing pain or trying to help you coming back from trauma such as falling off a horse or even wounds inflicted in war. All right, now you look at the blue routes, right? These are the routes that the Arabs and the Portuguese, their, their sea routes, it was dangerous. There were pirates, as there always been pirates, but the sea routes, right, they're time consuming. Columbus believed by sailing west he could deal directly in a wholesale market environment and save time. Not taking these long journeys could be anywhere from 8 months, 12 months, 16 months, 2 years. So his idea was to go west. I found this picture in Turkestan uh, of a modern day camel caravan 
Funny to think that here it is in the 21st century that the ships of the deserts, the camels, are still there. Okay. Still doing what they did as their ancestors did. Now, they had the advantage of, uh, you know, the, the, the original desert navigators had to use dead reckoning, which is the idea of using mathematics to calculate what you've already done to predict the future. Sometimes you can't use landmarks in a dead reckoning. Celestial navigation, and probably used primitive compasses. Later, we'll talk about the uh, astrolabe, but there was no sextant with these guys. That question came up another period. No, the sextant was not with the agents. All right, we did a worksheet talking about the fact that Spain in 1492 was a desperate land, financially strapped because of fighting centuries of wars. Even though the marriage of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand brought some hope, and that finally in 1492, the Spanish were able to, Christians were able to drive the Moors, the Moroccan Muslims, back into Africa. And how there was finally hope. Yes, I know the Inquisition. I know it was being fought at this particular time. The war against the Jews for conversion. And I know that Granada still remained an Islamic stronghold. But 1492 pretty much saw Spain return to its power its hope and its Christianity. Columbus sailing west, believe it or not, was not the cause of celebration. Most people thought that they would never hear from Columbus again, and rightfully so. 1492 was a big year because of the reconquest and return of Christianity and power in Spain. We talked about the Carvels. The Portuguese made a fantastic ship. We talked about the idea and uh, that they don't have to use a skeg. There's no skeg which allows these ships to get into shallow waters. You know, there's no big fin on the bottom of the boat of the hull to help it keep stable. That remains stable by using ballast rocks, huge stones, and cask full of wine, water, vinegar. It gives stability. It's a very wide hull boat, and even though it's not a big boat, the Portuguese were masters of these boats. The Spanish copied them. And these are the boats of ex exploration. No, they're not pirate ships, not yet, all right? They're not man of wars, they're not gunboats. Yes, there were some guns on there, but they were boats of exploration. There's another one. Fantastic, fantastic maritime engineering. Now on the test, Forgive my Spanish, Alcade de Agua, the mayor of water. You know, on that crew of 29, 30 men, everybody had a job. And I can't even imagine it took 10 weeks or 70 days from they left South Spain, Palos, that they finally got to the Bahamas, Watling Island, or the British call uh, Watling Island, the Spanish called San Salvador. Yes, I know they spent some time down in the Canary Islands. You see, that was Columbus's secret. The idea was that uh, the secret of wind, the circle of wind, would take them west of the Canary Islands into Asia, where they could establish their trade routes and diplomacy, uh, north up through Asia, Cathay, back west, where they come into either Portugal or northern part of Spain, and that circle of wind would speed everything up. Luckily for Columbus, the winds did pick up. He left since he left uh, the Canary Islands, and he actually traveled faster than he anticipated. But the thing I was going to try to tell you is that the mayor of water had a very important job. The distribution and rationing of all drinking water, whether it's livestock or crew. Men, you don't realize, maybe you do, how dehydrated you can get on a ship. The man who is in charge of the drinking water can be the reason for your failure or your success. And if he says you don't drink, you don't drink. All right. Now, remember we talked about that circle of wind? Or the astrolabe. What a fantastic tool for navigation. Really, pretty much for latitude. Some people could deduce longitude from it. We don't know if it was made by the Chinese and perfected by the, the Arabs. 
We do know that Prince Henry, the navigator, had a school in Portugal where they brought in Arabs to teach Europeans how to use the astrolabe. What an amazing, amazing device. An ancient GPS, if you will. Columbus definitely had one. All oh, the tacking, yes. Getting back to that circle of wind. If that circle of wind does not exist and travel across the entire Atlantic Ocean and return back to Spain or Portugal, Columbus is going to have to tack into a headwind which will take him so long that his crew will either die of dehydration or frustration. Luckily, Columbus did not have to tack and his secret, his lifelong secret, the secret he was willing to sell to the highest bidder, in this case Spain, he didn't have to tack home. In fact, you know, I told you on the way out he was traveling so much faster than he anticipated. There's that little correction when he started to understand it. he was moving very quickly and he recalculated. He actually got afraid. He was actually fudging his diary, writing in fake numbers to make the crew think they're going slower than they really were because he thought when he got to this point he would be in Asia or Cathay and he wasn't. If he had not recalculated and did what he did, some people believe he may have actually ended up in North Fort Lauderdale. Crazy. That's his first journey. But he comes across a Tejano. And you know, these are very generous, giving people. But there was a problem. No gold, no silver. Any gold or silver that they had was probably brought to them by trading with other tribes. There's no gold or silver. That's what Columbus really wanted. That's what Spain wanted. They even experimented with tobacco. We talked about how the Tejano would smoke cigars through the nostril. I can't imagine that. But it's interesting, the Spanish do not go after tobacco as a commodity. That'll be the English in the Mid-Atlantic States about a hundred and some odd years later. But guys, remember this, the slogan was God, gold and glory. I changed it because it was actually gold, gold and gold. The conquistadors often were men that were quite, shall we say, ethnocentric. They didn't appreciate the cultures they ran into. They were concerned about wealth and power. And at times they believed the Native Americans, because they lacked technology and were not, shall we say, willing to accept Christianity without question, were persecuted. Ethnocentric is when you believe that your way of life, your values, your religion, are superior to everyone else's. We also talked about the fact that the Spanish brought two new races with them, or created two new races, mulatto, European and uh, African descents, and mestizos, Native American Indians and European descent. And we'll talk more about that in later chapters. Uh, I might throw that on the test. I still don't understand how Columbus beat hurricane season. That's incredible to me. Wow. Look at this red chart, man. The odds were against him. You know, August and September are the two worst months. Here we are in October when I'm making this tape, and we've already had I don't even know how many tropical storms. How did Columbus, Columbus just lucked out? Because as well built as those ships were, a tropical storm or hurricane would have ended that adventure very very quickly. We talked about they may have found the original Santa Maria that crashed on Christmas Day off of the coast of Haiti and the four men left behind at the Camp Navidad, those 40 men who never saw Spain again, probably killed by the Native Americans because the Spanish were so busy looking for gold and silver that they forgot to worry about crops and hunting and we think they may begin to, shall we say, steal the Native Americans food sources and that led to conflict and unfortunately tragedy. We talked about the four journeys, right? All right. And uh, the one thing I want to tell you was that the big one was the Columban Exchange. Let me get to this slide. Now Columbus didn't bring back gold and silver but he began to bring back stuff that he convinced the crown unfortunately would be great for slavery. The idea of plantations because the new world had, had offered all sorts of new 
agricultural products that Spain was hungry for because Spain, the soil was tired. They'd been at war for so long. But, you know, we talked about this in detail, the things that went back to Europe. But look at the things that came from Europe. And the one thing I want to focus on is smallpox. Men, the disease smallpox may have killed 80 to 90 percent of the Native Americans in the Caribbean and especially in Florida. The African slaves were not so much affected by it because the proximity of Africa to Europe, they seem to work up an immunity. But because of the geographic isolation of the Americas, the Native Americans had no immunity to smallpox, and they just it 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 just they took a beating with it. Men, I always find it interesting. I tell people in the Everglades that all the wild pigs in the Everglades are descendants of the Spanish pigs brought by Pedro Menendez de Avalis and St. Augustine. And how the horses who were hunted to extinction by the Paleo-Indians so many years ago in North America were reintroduced by the Spanish. The old cowboy westerns of Mustangs and Appaloosas and all that kind of good stuff are actually the descendants of escaped Spanish horses from the conquistadors. The Columbian Exchange, all oh, absolutely on the test. Men, I try to tell people, please remember, Columbus didn't die in the gutter. He wasn't, you know, a broken man, a complete total failure. Yeah, he had some legal challenges. Yeah, his son spent a lot of time in court trying to get what his father was owed. You know, I mean, he had his ups and downs. But, you know, he's going to die. He wasn't, he wasn't a rich man when he died. But the big issue was not the fact that he was, shall we say, disrespected. The big issue was that he had a lot of legal battles because sometimes Spain felt like he didn't fully live up to the contract. But, you know, he died at the age of 54, which is good for that time. If you live to be in your 40s, you've had a full life. But he suffered immeasurably because of an inflammatory disease called arthritis. Now, interesting to me, I don't know where Columbus is buried. People have moved his bodies back and forth, back from the New World, right? Back from the Dominican Republic, back to Seville, Spain. And there's even rumors that that body in that coffin is not really Columbus's bones. I would love to visit this and give my respects. It's part of the intrigue of Columbus. But remember, men, Columbus was the man who turned the key to change everything in our history, the history of the world. A determined sailor, a controversial sailor, a controversial leader. But men, no one can deny the fact that his determination put in an event things that change everybody's life forever. So as a sailor myself, as a man of the sea, I have immeasurable respect for Columbus' determination, his ability to navigate, his ability to carry on. Yes, he's a man of controversy, and yes, he's a man of uh, great, great, great debate, but he was a game changer. Men, I hope you enjoy this particular lecture today. We're gonna have that test coming up, standard procedure of 20 questions, 10 multiple choice, 10 true and false. And if you look at the PowerPoints on topics on the homepage and you look at my YouTube video, I think you're going to be okay. All right. This is OB signing off. I'm going to have a wonderful afternoon. And remember, 